that I'm excited about um, uh, sharing this evening for about a week and a half. I have not, uh, I've been unable to escape the text that I'm going to share tonight. It's just kept coming after me. I'll frame this message in what I believe is God's word for the year for me, and I've shared a little bit at ORU, but the text I'll start with tonight is very unique. I've never preached from this passage as a text, and I have just continued to feel drawn to it, and I don't even understand why. I told Pastor Joe, I said, I, I'm just preaching by faith tonight. Uh, but I want you to go with me to an Old Testament book, the book of Ezekiel, we're going to start in chapter 9 at verse 3, uh, and uh, I don't think it'll all be on the PowerPoint, but I'm going to read all the way through verse 6 tonight because I think it gives you a good context. It, it's a very weird passage and unusual, but it captures what I want to talk about tonight, and I've called my thoughts this evening, Marked for Mercy, Marked for Mercy. Verse 3, now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in Jerusalem. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men, women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark beginning at my sanctuary. Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you tonight for the celebration, the anointing and worship we have felt. Lord, tonight this is a, a simple word from your word. And I need help, Lord, to deliver it. I pray, God, as we go through this message, that you would baptize this room from the very back row in the balcony to the front row in your mercy. Baptize us in the mercy of God for this new year. I pray, God, for revival tonight. And I pray, Lord, at the end of this message, life change would happen to many in this place, including myself. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Ezekiel 9 is written by the prophet Ezekiel from exile. He is in Babylon. He is away from his home of Jerusalem and Judah. He has been there for a few years. He's been having visitations of God. The book of Ezekiel starts with a visitation from God in a foreign land in Babylon. And in the succeeding chapters after chapter 1, after seeing the wheel in the middle of a wheel and the glory of God, God begins to unveil to him what he's about to do to Jerusalem. Now, there had been a deportation of some, but Jerusalem itself and Judah had survived politically up until this point. God would reveal to Ezekiel that those days were coming to an end. He showed Ezekiel that there would be a great siege of the city of Jerusalem, and that ultimately, Babylonians would take over Jerusalem and would scatter the people, the Jewish people, and the people of Judah literally all over the world. And in this time, Ezekiel is away from Jerusalem. There's no social media. There's no FaceTime. There's no way to communicate. But he's hearing from the Holy Spirit and from God. As we move into chapters 7 and 8 of Ezekiel, God begins to tell him why He's going to do what he's going to do to Jerusalem and Judah. And the why was because of their sin. In one point in chapter 8, he takes uh, Ezekiel to, uh, to the wall of Jerusalem, and he shows him a hole in the wall. I, heard, I read a message years ago that a preacher preached way, way back called the hole in the wall gang. And uh, he told Ezekiel to open the door in the wall, and when he did, he saw the elders, the spiritual leaders, of the nation worshiping idols, and God says, now there is some of the reason I'm going to destroy the city and bring judgment. So judgment is on the way. Jerusalem is not going to stand. The wall is going to be torn down. The temple is going to be raised. Uh, the elements of the temple are going to be carried away into Babylon, and people are going to be scattered in captivity, and uh, the glory of God has moved from the sanctuary and not to return for a very long time. 
It is a time of severe judgment. And in the middle of this picture of judgment, God begins to give Ezekiel a picture of mercy. And he says, I'm going to send people through the city. Now, this is going to be the Babylonians. They're going to destroy the city. They're going to kill lots of people. But he said, before that happens, I'm sending my angel through the city, and everyone that is grieving over the sin of Judah and Jerusalem, the angel is going to mark them. And whoever has this mark is going to receive my mercy and will not be destroyed. Now, our God is a God of judgment, but he's also, thank God, a God of mercy, a God of mercy. In fact, as I started the new year, the Lord led me to a word. I'd never thought about this word much. Used to, I prayed the names of God, El Shaddai and uh, Jehovah Jireh and all of those names of God. Uh, I prayed in my prayer time about 20 years ago and had an hour of prayer, and they had an initiative going on in the kingdom of God of praying the names of God. I learned all kinds of names of God, but I never prayed this name of God, and boy, I needed it a lot. I wished I'd have known it back then. And the, the name of God is El Rakum, El Rakum, which means God of mercy or merciful God. It comes from a passage in Deuteronomy 4, verse 31. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. One of the great glories of God when revealed to Moses in his glory was that God shows mercy to thousands, that he is the God, not just a God who shows mercy, but that in God's very nature of who he is, in the substance of the eternal, is the nature of mercy. Wow. The Hebrew word for mercy used in the Old Testament comes from the root word rahamim, and it's the same root word as the word womb, like a mother's womb very interesting word. I'll talk about it some in this message tonight. That in many ways, God's mercy is protective around us like the womb of a mother protects the baby. That the mercies of God surround us. God's Word says His mercies are new every morning. God's Word says His mercies endure from generation to generation. Like a womb surrounding my life, God's mercy protects me from the wrath of the enemy and the wrath of God caused by my own sin. In the New Testament, the Greek word for mercy comes from the word elios, which means pity or compassion. It's the same root word I've been surprised to find as the word olive or olive oil, which is used many times in New Testament times to soothe and to heal. When God's Word cuts us, when God brings judgment on our life, when God disciplines us, it's the mercy of God that brings healing. Aren't you glad for those people who have the gift of mercy? You want to get up close to them because it seems like they're so encouraging, so loving. It just heals your heart to be with them. God's mercy. Now, grace from God is getting what I don't deserve. The acrostic sometimes is used, God's riches at Christ's expense. We, we receive grace, I get what I don't deserve. But mercy, on the other hand, is not getting what I do deserve. I like mercy. Not getting what I do deserve. Now, at our university, students plead mercy a lot. Uh, they accuse me as their teacher of not having a lot of mercy. They tell me my weakest gift is the mercy gift because I'm, I want them to do well in school. But I'm glad that I don't get, I don't receive what I should receive. The Bible tells us that I'm worthy of death. I, I, I'm worthy to be destroyed. I've transgressed the law of God. I should go to hell. But God's mercy says I'm not going to give Billy what he deserves. I'm going to have mercy on him. Wow. Wow the mercy of God. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we find mercy uh, shown to us in, in word pictures, so to speak. I want to talk about three of them. These are sort of three word pictures in the Old Testament that talk about the mercies of God and places people can find mercy. The first is a very unique construct in the judicial system of the Old Testament, and it, it's called the cities of refuge, the cities of refuge. 
When God's people were going into the land of Canaan, God told Moses that the Levites were not to own any territory. They were not to take any territory. But he gave them 48 cities. And then he told Moses, six of those 48 cities should be cities of refuge. Places where people could find protection. Now, the law was that if you committed murder, if you killed someone, that a family member of the family where, that you committed, that you killed someone in, a family member was assigned as the avenger of the family, and their assignment was to kill you. Remember, in the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We still see this principle going on in the Middle East today. Uh, when someone's killed, it, the family and, and the nation says, we got to kill somebody because somebody killed somebody here. And so it just keeps going and going and going. But if you committed manslaughter, unintentional murder, still an avenger was assigned to kill you. But if you committed manslaughter, you could get to one of these six cities. Now, I think we have a picture of them on the screen. You'll see there were three of them on the east side of the Jordan River and three of them on the west side of the Jordan River. And the goal was that a refuge city would be within one day's journey of everyone that lived in the land, okay? That from all the Israelites, they could get to a city of refuge in one day. So if you accidentally killed someone, you could run to that city, you would report to the gate of the city. You would tell the people in the city what had happened, the elders, that I unintentionally killed someone. They would let you into the city, and then later on you would be put on trial through the Levitical system. And if it was judged that indeed the murder, the killing, was unintentional, you could stay in the city of refuge, and the avenger could not get to you until the high priest died and when he died, you were free to go, and they still could not kill you. City of refuge. We know by Scripture that God is our refuge. That we can run to him and find protection. David understood this in a cave running from King Saul who was trying to kill him. And so David writes in Psalm 57 and verse 1, uh, to the tune of a song called Do Not Destroy a Mictum. When he had fled from Saul into the cave, he says this, Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I'll take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Cities of refuge. Another place that people found mercy in the Old Testament was at the horns of the altar. In 1 Kings chapter 1, Ahithophel, who was the half-brother of Solomon who would be king and the son of King David, decides that David is getting old, he's on his deathbed, and Ahithophel decides he's going to be the next king. God didn't assign it, but he assigned it. He gets Joab to join him, he gets the high priest to join him, and they anoint Ahithophel to be king. Well, word gets to Nathan the prophet, who gets the word to Bathsheba, because David had promised Bathsheba that her son Solomon would be the next king. And so Bathsheba gets to David on his deathbed and says, have you heard what's happened? Ahithophel has claimed to be king and crowned himself. And so um, he said, no, that's not what's supposed to be. So he calls in the prophet. He says, get my donkey, put Solomon on it, take him to a certain point and anoint him to be king and shout that he is king so all of Jerusalem and Israel will know that they have a new king and it is going to be King Solomon. So they did that. They anointed Solomon as king. When that happened, Ahithophel realized that his moment of treason had been discovered. He was in big trouble. He was going to be killed. And so he runs to the tabernacle area and he runs into the court of sacrifice and he grabs the horns of the altar. Now, the horns of the altar were places that stuck up on the edge of the altar. And so if you can imagine, this uh, strong man runs and grabs the horns of the altar as if to say, I'm pleading my case at the altar of God that I would find mercy. When Solomon hears of it, planning to kill Ahithophel, he decides to show him mercy 
he found mercy at the altar of God. Third place that you could find mercy in the Old Testament was at a place called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat was a uh, was the lid that was placed on the Ark of the Covenant. You see a picture on the screen of the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat is actually this plate on top of it that has these two cherubim angels. Now, cherubims were not like seraphim. Seraphim were fire angels, but cherubims were protecting angels. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, God sent two cherubims to protect the garden so they couldn't get back in. And so in this picture that God draws through the Ark of the Covenant... He's showing that they are protecting uh, what is inside the ark. Uh, and uh, some of you know, if you study the Old Testament, that the ark of the covenant became the focal point in Israel for the glory of God. And so it was placed in a place called the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and the glory of God, the pillar of fire at night and cloud by day, would settle, and where God's glory settled was right here on the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. Now, inside the Ark were three things. There was a pot of manna to remind them that God was providing manna in the wilderness. There was Aaron's rod that budded that, provided, that reminded them that God had anointed leadership among them. And there were, were the tablets of the law of God. The Ark of the Covenant representing God's law, overshadowed by God's glory. And in between that, the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat was important because once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Now, when he went into the Holy of Holies, two things had to happen. First, he had to sacrifice an animal for his own sin. And if he did that right, when he stepped behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, into the Shekinah, the glory of God, he would live. They tied a, tied a rope to his leg, so if he didn't do it right and die, they could pull him out without going in themselves. He would have incense, so he would uh, make smoke in that small chamber called the Holy of Holies, lest he see the face of God and die. And the second thing he did was not only sacrifice for his own sin, but he took the blood of a goat into the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Signifying the covering of the sin of the people of Israel. Now listen closely. The mercy seat was between God's law and God's glory. Without the mercy seat, without the shedding of blood, without the covering of, of the blood, we would die because we cannot keep God's law and God is holy and pure and powerful. The only thing that allows us to live in the presence of God is the shedding of the blood of Jesus shed at a place that could be called the heavenly mercy seat so we can survive and see and feel and know the glory of God without being killed because of God's mercy. Come on, give God praise. Amen and amen. Mm. So the Old Testament gives us these word pictures of where people and how people found the mercies of God. They all point toward Jesus Christ. He's our refuge. We can run to the altar and find him. And the shedding of his blood allows us to stand before holy God. Jesus came to mediate the mercies of God. In him are God's mercies to us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 and 16 says this, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Over and over again, then, in the New Testament, people found mercy 
in Jesus Christ. In fact, you'll hear this term all through the New Testament as people cry out for God's mercy through Jesus. Just in the book of Matthew, a few occasions. There are two different occasions in the book of Matthew where two blind men were healed. One happens in the Galilee area. The other happens down in Jericho. And in both instances, the blind men cry out to Jesus saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us. Jesus, show us God's mercy. Don't give us what we deserve. Give us what we don't deserve. Show us the mercy of God. We see this continue. Even a Gentile woman comes to Jesus. Her daughter is being beat up by the devil. She's grievously vexed. She's got a huge spiritual problem. When this Gentile woman comes to Jesus, she says to him, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's possessed and suffering terribly. Or a man whose son is demon-possessed. He brought the son to the disciples. They couldn't cast the demon out of the boy. And so Jesus comes. And when Jesus gets there, uh, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him and says, Lord, have mercy on my son. In other words, over and over and over again, people ran to Jesus saying, you're the one that can give us the mercies of God. We feel under judgment. We feel condemned. We feel rejected. We feel under the weight of hell and sin and death. But we run to you, Jesus, because you can show us God's mercy. Yeah. Wow. Wow mercy. One place in Jesus' ministry, he goes to a place called the Pool of Bethesda. The word Bethesda means house of mercy. He finds one man who over and over again can't get into the water soon enough to get healed because an angel would trouble the water. God's mercy for the sick was to allow them some healing at the pool. And this day, mercy personified in Jesus comes into the room and finds the man. And in just a moment, the man is walking and healed by the mercies of God. Now, listen closely tonight. We need God's mercy in our day. In a time when God's judgment is completely justified in America, We need God's mercy. All around the world, and especially in the United States, the sins and reproach of this nation means God's judgment is certainly on the way. I don't say that to be negative tonight. It's just the truth. Great writer Leonard Ravenhill said, God will have to apologize for Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't judge America. And that's the truth. And so if you go underneath and you look through the hole in the wall, the corruption both in government and in society and in business and sometimes even in the church means that God is withholding his judgment, but judgment will be certain. God will not play around. He will not tolerate sin forever. But in the middle of it, I am convinced that God is looking for people who grieve over their own sin and the sin of the nation and the sins around them, and he's marking them that they will have his mercies in the middle of judgment, in the middle of the day we're in. While we're living in a a spiritual Babylon, we're going to be marked for the mercies of God and know God's mercy in the middle of it all. Come on, give God praise tonight. (laughs) Hallelujah. Wow. (laughs) Wow, wow, wow. So how can we in our society, in our generation, be marked for mercy? Obviously, we put our trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. When the priest went into the Holy of Holies and went to the mercy seat and put the blood there, it was symbolizing that someday Jesus would shed his blood. As our high priest, he would take the blood before the Father and it would, it would be the place that would cover us between the law and the glory, allowing us to enter God's presence forever. In the Old Testament, when 
Judgment is coming through Egypt, and God is visiting judgment after centuries of sin and failure in Egypt. And finally, God has had enough, and he's visiting Egypt for their sins. He says to the people of God, I want you to kill a lamb tonight. I want you to take the blood of that lamb. I want you to put it on the doorpost of your home and over over the door of your home. And when I see the blood, I'll see that you have been marked for my mercy, and I will pass over you and you will survive and thrive in the middle of my judgment. (laughs) Oh, come on. The blood of Jesus shed on Calvary. We put our trust not in ourselves, not in our good works. In my good works alone, I'm still stuck in the bottom part of the ark, trying to keep God's law in my own power and will. And that will mean destruction because surely the glory of God who is holy knows that I can't keep God's law in myself. Rather, rather, I have put my trust in the blood of Jesus uh, that he shed on the cross uh, that I could be saved and know the mercies of God. Mercy, mercy. We trust in what Jesus did on Calvary and we live in a spirit of brokenness and repentance. I want to close with a parable found in Luke chapter 18. Jesus is talking a lot about prayer in this chapter, and he gives us a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, a Pharisee was a religious guy. He dressed religiously, he looked religiously, he went to synagogue, he read the scripture, he prayed several times a day, he fasted, he tithed. He was a really good churchgoer. He was a faithful churchgoer. A tax collector, on the other hand, was usually a vagabond, usually a renegade, and usually a criminal, or at least in criminal activity who would gather the taxes of the people and keep a little for himself. So most of the people hated tax collectors. Very few people like people that work for the IRS, you know. (laughs) I'm sorry. If you work for the IRS, I'm sorry, but don't tell anybody. Just say I'm an accountant. Don't tell them you work for the IRS. (laughs) But even more so in those times because they enforced Roman rule and extracted the taxes from the people even against the people's will. So Jesus says this churchgoer, this Pharisee guy, went to the temple, and the tax collector, amazingly, he went to the temple. And both of them start to pray. And Jesus gives us the Pharisee's prayer first. The Pharisee says something like, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like other people. I'm not a thief. I'm not a whoremonger. I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a sinner. Thank God I'm not a tax collector over there. I pay my tithes every week. I go to church. I pray. I live right. Surely you're going to answer my prayer. And Jesus flips the script and visits with the tax collector. And the Bible says it this way in Luke 18. The tax collector stood at a distance representing his humility and fear of God. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus then says, I tell you that this man rather than the other, went home justified before God. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Hmm. Hmm. Which category you fit in? I got to admit, sometimes in my life, I feel like the Pharisee. I'm not proud of that. It's just the truth. I'm glad I'm not like her or him. I see somebody do something bad, and I think, thank God I don't do that. 
Thank God I don't do that, and I do thank God. Thank God I'm not that way. But I'm going to tell you, when I, when I come before the holy presence of God, when I enter the inner sanctuary, when I come in my private prayer time before the almighty God, it's not the time to be proud. The truth is, I deserve to die. I am a sinner away from God without Jesus Christ. I was a broken, corrupted, failing teenager coming from a broken home. My, my dad was a preacher that failed God. My grandfather failed God. It should have been in my lineage to fail God. I have no rights before God. I don't come boasting. I come grateful for the mercies of the living God. The Lord really spoke to me that as we enter 2024 in this world like Babylon where judgment is all around us, all the time, that we not find ourselves like the Pharisee, arrogant, proud, even spiritually. Oh, yes, we need to do right. We need to live right. But it's not going to get you brownie points with God. Rather, we must enter 2024 in humility, saying to God, Son of David, have mercy on me. I need your mercy. I need the covering of your blood. For those who exalt themselves in this season will be brought down. But those who humble themselves will be exalted and lifted up, and God will mark them for his mercy and will show his mercies to the world in the middle of judgment. The God of mercy, El Rahum, wants to mark your life and show you his compassion. He wants to surround you like a mother's womb in his mercy. I woke up this morning in prayer and I thought, God, I I just feel the covering, the protection of your mercy on my life. Wow, wow that you covered me because of the blood of Christ, because I've trusted in Calvary. I'm in the womb of God's mercy. And though a thousand may fall on one side of me and 10,000 on the other side of me, it will not come nigh me because God's mercy has covered my life. I'll be honest with you, in this season of my Uh, growing old years. I'm not old yet, but I'm growing there. I find myself more grateful every day for God's mercy. Oh, I've needed it so much, and I still need his mercy today. I don't feel much like boasting or being proud because the truth is anything that's ever happened good in my life has been because God had mercy on me. He loved me. He showed me his tender mercy. He let me discover the newness, the freshness, that every morning he's wanting to show us his mercy if we just humble ourselves and admit our need. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.